It's interesting when we talk about the promises of God and the beautiful song that was just chosen to start off the lectureship, you couldn't have chosen a better song because it's a song that, first of all, it, it kind of, it's like an anthem to us as Christians to march and stand and work and fight and go into battle for our Lord. And I remember as a young man before my dad let me preach my first sermon, I was a song leader, and it was one of my favorite songs because with my high-pitched voice, I could, I could sing that song and hold the notes forever. Uh, the fact is, it, it uh, allows us to look within, ask ourselves the questions about who we are, whose we are, and what God wants from us. God, the promise maker, is God, the promise keeper. Every promise that God gives us has a condition. God wants us to be better. God wants us to be saved. God wants us to come to heaven. This is not your home. I know you've been told this. You have some wonderful ministers here and great shepherds and deacons and teachers. So I know that we know that this is not our home and we cannot stay. God has already let us know that we're going to leave one of these days. So God gives us great and precious promises. And why does he do this? Because in performing the conditions, we get the promises. God says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. That's a condition. And then the promise, all these things shall be added unto you. The Lord wants us to be saved, to be better, to be happy, to be filled with joy. And this can happen only when we follow him, obey him, and stand on his promises and expect God to keep his word toward us so that we can become the people that God wants us to become. He tells us to receive with meekness, with meekness, the engrafted, implanted word which is able to save our souls. Pray with me briefly. Merciful God, this evening, as we stand before your people, the greatest people on earth, it is our prayer that the things that we say and the things that we do will be pleasing to you and edify us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> He was right, there is no clock in here. <laughs> so if I preach forever. <laughs> Some of my fondest and proudest memories of my parents, my grandparents and my great-grandparents, as I look back in my life and I realize how blessed I was at one time in my life to have those three sets of parents. And the things that they did for us, me and my brothers and sisters, who were born at the time, there were four of us. Their commitment and faithfulness to God and their commitment and faithfulness to their family, especially their children, made an impression on me as a very young man. And as I watch my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather, that's one of the things I always wanted to be. I wanted to be a father. I wanted to be a husband. I wanted to be a family man. I wanted to emulate and imitate those things that they had shown me by their fidelity toward their children and toward their family. My father and my mother taught us the meaning of family, of faith, of fidelity, by the way they conducted themselves. There wasn't a lot of extra in the DeBerry home. There weren't a whole lot of stuff. As we look around today where we have more stuff than we can do anything with, but there was plenty of the essentials the essential stuff, the essential elements that made that house, that home, a great place to grow up and be strengthened. That was assurance in my parents' house that no matter where, what uh, was going on in life, they were there for us. No matter what the problems, we would sit around the dinner table in the evening, and there we would talk about what had happened in our lives at school and all around. And my parents were always there to listen. There was safety. Their protective care kept us away from harm and danger. And as children, as the scriptures say, foolishness is in the heart of a child. So in essence, they became the parents that they ought to be. 
And you know that when we look around us today, we see adult-like children and child-like adults. But my parents let us know real quick who was in charge uh, in our house. There were provisions. They would do without themselves on many occasions so that we could have the nice things that they were happy to see us enjoy and have as children as we were growing up. Childhood is short, my dad used to say. You only get to be a child for a little while, and then you've got to live the rest of your life with those memories. And they did everything they could to make them wonderful memories. There was sacrifice that no matter what they had to do, we were going to be raised, we were going to be churched, we were going to be taught, and we were going to be educated. We were going to be mannerable children. We were going to be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There was no question in our house. And I know you've heard this before, and I didn't originate it, but all of the DeBerry children had a drug problem. We were drugged to Bible class. We were drugged to vacation Bible school, gospel meetings, night service. And if there was a gospel meeting in a hundred mile radius, they drug us there too. And we learned to love it and appreciate it because our parents displayed a type of joy that I wanted in my life, that I wanted my children to have, that I wanted in the wife and the woman that I married, the woman, young woman that I met at Freed Hardeman in 1970 and eventually married. When we think about this now, I know that there was a time when my dad came from the Army that he had three jobs, and those three jobs he worked all day, and I was the eldest, and I got a chance from time to time to go to work with him on one of his jobs, which was to lock up the mausoleum in the cemetery. I would hold on to his britches real tight when he went to that cemetery. My dad used to tell me, don't be afraid, Nick. There's nobody in here that's going to hurt you. The folks on the outside are the folks that are going to hurt you. But what it taught me was a dedication to his family, a dedication to our care, and that nobody owed me anything, and I had to work for everything. Being the oldest, he taught me to work, that nothing was free, that what I deserved was an opportunity and the responsibility to take charge of that opportunity. What's the relevance of all of this, you might say? Well, the word faithful. When we talk about God being faithful, that word faithful means to demonstrate loyalty, steadfastness, fidelity, being true to your word, keeping your promises, being an individual that someone can depend on, can trust, can lean on. That's what faithfulness means. And therefore, when we look at God, our Father, I have to think about my father as I was preparing this lesson and understanding that God is my father. He is my father in heaven. From that great sermon that's recorded in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7, we affectionately call it the Sermon on the Mountain, where Jesus sat on an obscure hill that day with the natural acoustics of the Sea of Galilee behind him, and he spoke to those folks on that day and preached the greatest sermon that has ever been preached, the sermon that changed the world. Because Jesus brought a doctrine that nobody had heard ever before. I tell folk everywhere I go that Christianity is not natural, brothers and sisters. It's not natural. Jesus said, love your enemies. That's not natural. Jesus said, if someone requires your coat, give them your cloak also. That's not natural. Jesus said, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. That's not natural. And then he said, if someone smites you on your right cheek, turn your left. Lord knows, I know that ain't natural. And the fact is that Christianity in that sermon Jesus changed the world by telling us and showing us and demonstrating to us a different way to live. The natural man says, you shoot my dog, I kill your cat. That's the natural man. But Jesus said, 
be different, show different, and change yourself from the inside. That being so, in that sermon, Jesus appears to be offended by those who don't understand that God is a good father, that God is a faithful father, that God is a God of fidelity, that God is a God of love and caring, and God keeps his promises. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 8, and continuing through verses 11, Jesus said in that wonderful sermon, For everyone that asketh, receive it. And he that seeketh, find it. And he that knocketh, it shall be open. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son, Jesus said, ask you for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask you for a fish, will give him a snake, a serpent? And then Jesus went on to make his point in verses 11. Jesus said, if you being evil, you being the natural man, you being the one that sinned and broke God's heart, you being the one that transgressed, you being the one who has finite ability where God has infinite ability, he said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Jesus set the record straight on that day. Jesus says, how dare you stand here and talk about judging and talk about various issues as though God is not a good God. God said, I know how to take care of my children because God is faithful by God's very nature. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is universally present. Uh, present. God must always be faithful, always be loving, always show mercy, always show kindness. God cannot violate your free moral agency, and God cannot punish the righteous with the wicked. God as a good father, as a faithful father, is a whole lot like what my dad learned from reading about God. That is, God will not save you without your consent, and God will not save you without your participation. God wants every one of you to be saved, every one of you to be filled with joy and have a good life because that is his nature. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 10 and verses 23, Jeremiah the weeping prophet, as he looked at God's people who are lost, who are ignorant of God's graciousness, his mercy, and his fidelity and faithfulness, who are acting in such a way that God has to ask on one occasion, what iniquity do you see in me? What iniquity do you, God is saying, what have I done to you? When have I not kept a promise? When did I tell you I was going to do something and didn't do it? God let them know through the prophets, I brought you out of Egypt. I opened up the Red Sea and you walked through on dry ground. I destroyed the Egyptians' entire religious system with ten plagues, each plague tearing down and demolishing something that they worship. God says, I did this for you. What iniquity do you see in me? And do you know if God looked at us today, many of us today, he would have to ask us the same question. When did I not take care of you? When did you call on me and I didn't answer? When were you sick and lost and, and broken down and broken hearted and without hope? And I did not come and be with you. What iniquity do you see in me? The same weeping prophet in the book of Jeremiah chapter 10 and in verses 23, Jeremiah tells what the problem is. Jeremiah said as he wept for Israel, Oh Lord, oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, 
it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. In essence, Jeremiah said, sometimes we're so blinded by those things that are happening around us that we can't see what is right in front of us. I remember one occasion, I came to the table, had been at football practice, and I came to my mama's table. I took my shirt off and sat down at my mama's table, and my dad made me get up and said, don't you disrespect your mama like that. You go and you come back to her table properly. You don't sit down like some animal and slop your food up and don't respect your mama. How many of us act that way with God? How many of us act like God is not even in the room, that God is not even listening, that God doesn't keep his promises, and that God doesn't care? Don't you know that when Solomon said, the fool, the fool has said in his heart, he didn't say the fool said it verbally. He didn't say the fool made a statement, there is no God. He said the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Translation, Solomon, he's saying that that person who is acting foolish, many today are what are called practical atheists. It's not that they don't believe there's a God. They just live like there is no God. And that's what the prophets are saying to God's people, really wanting them to change their ways and change their minds. What we've got to understand, all of us must understand that God is a good God who is not willing to lose any of us. David said one time in the book of Psalms 84 and verses 11, he said that no good thing is withheld from them that walk uprightly. According to David, God provides. God is faithful. God's fidelity is without question to those who walk uprightly. What's the condition for that promise of God's not withholding anything from us? The condition is that we walk uprightly. God wants to be respected by all of those who claim that they love him. Jesus equated love with obedience. He said, if you love me, if you love me, don't just tell me you love me. He said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Then I'll know that you love me because you obey me. David said once, he let us know that the righteous, unlike the wickedness, have God's continued faithfulness and fidelity. In the book of Psalms 37 and verses 25, David said, I have been young, I am now old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed, his offspring, his children begging bread. For this reason, David, he said in the book of Psalms 23, or in, in the 23rd Psalms, rather, David makes one of the most beautiful statements that's in the scriptures. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That word want comes from a Hebrew word, which means lack. David says, I lack nothing because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When the righteous depend upon God, look upon God, trust in God's fidelity, then they lack for nothing. Many seem to believe that God's some kind of deadbeat dad. He's negligent. He's a bad parent. If you listen to the way some of us think about God, God is an absent father. He just created us, made us, formed us from the dust of the earth, breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and then left us to make it on our own, take your best shot. If you do well, fine. If you don't do well, fine. No, that's not the God of the Bible. That is not the God of the Scripture. He didn't just do that. As a matter of fact, David declared in Psalm 40 
and verses 17. He says, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverance. When we have those episodes in life, God is faithful. When you have those moments of hopelessness, God is faithful. When the fears of this life, sickness and trouble and financial upheaval, family problems, God is faithful. We have to turn to him and we have to trust him. David said in Psalms 34 and verses 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. How many times have you had problems in life? I know I've been there. When I have gone to the end of my powers, of my money, of my abilities, of my intelligence, I can't figure it out. And there have been times when I've just had to fall on my knees and say, Lord, I got to turn this over to you because I can't carry it any further. And without fail, without fail, not one time in my life has the Lord not helped me and strengthened me and opened my eyes and put joy in my heart, even in the midst of trouble and death and sorrow and loss. I am taught that all things work together, all of it together, the good and the bad, all of it together works for the benefit of those that love the Lord. I remember in 1971, we had a terrible tragedy in our family while I was still at Freed Hardeman. I got a call from my preacher there in Memphis that had baptized me and married me and my wife eventually. He said, John, I need you to come to Memphis. I said, why? He said, there's been an accident, a car accident. I said, what? He says, your mother. I said, my mother. He says, your sister. I said, my sister. He says, your brother. I says, my brother. And all three of them had perished that night in a car accident. Waking up from a dead sleep and getting this news. I remember trying to hold on to sanity as one of my friends one of the basketball players there at Freed Hardeman put me in his car and drove me to Memphis. And I got there and my dad was on his knees beside the bed, praying and, and crying because all of them had been there to witness their demise. But that's not what I'm trying to tell you. I remember at the funeral with the three caskets sitting there in front of me. I was 18 years old, just about to turn 19. And the preachers quoted that scripture, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. And I didn't appreciate it. As a matter of fact, I was offended. I was angry. I was in Brother Tom Holland's preacher in his work class, sermon prep class. I was in Brother Bradfield's class. I was in Brother Woodson's class. I was there with all of those fine preachers at that time, but at that moment, it was a moment when my very faith, my faith was tested. As a young man, I was ready to fold the Bible up and put it in a box and go to corporate America and do something else with him saying, all things work together. What was good about that? What was good about that? And as I regained my sanity, I got back to school and Brother Claude Gardner sat down with me and several of the other brothers sat down with me and they said, what is God trying to do for you, John? Where is God trying to send you? What is he trying to make of you? What type of strength is he trying to put in you? Where is he setting your feet to go? What is he giving you the ability to do that perhaps some others may not be able to do? And over the last 50 years, I have had those moments where I've had to say to people, it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do because you can't hurt me, bother me, deter me, or turn me around because I had to learn that all things work together 
for the good of them that love the Lord. The Lord didn't say it was good. But he said, what I learned, what I took away from that tragedy made me a better husband and appreciate my wife more for 45 years almost. Made me a better father and appreciate my children while I had them. Made me a better preacher. I had already done at least a couple of funerals and I had to ask myself, did you really have empathy as you delivered those lessons, or were you just academic, quoting the scriptures that needed to be quoted in order to carry out some type of ceremony? The fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, that God strengthens us. He strengthens us because he's with us. He's faithful to us. He won't leave us. He won't abandon us. There is no hurt. He cannot heal. There's no problem he cannot solve. There is no way that he cannot show. And there is no pain that he cannot take away. But we have to trust him each and every day. I remember uh, the last time I saw my mother. I had come out of church. I had preached that morning. I had been at Freed Hardeman. My, for two semesters, and I knew everything. I stood in the pulpit. My dad said, my son's going to preach this morning. Got up in the pulpit, but I marched in the pulpit, and I stood there, and I homiled it, and I hermeneuted it, and I exegeted, and I Hebrewed and Greeked, and I showed them what I'd learned in just a couple of semesters at Freed Hardeman. My dad just smiled and dropped his head. He didn't say nothing because he knew what was going to happen. My mama was going to get me. And I walked out to the door, and I'm standing there at the door. Some of y'all may have heard me tell this story. And as I was walking out proud of myself, my mama grabbed me by my necktie. She pulled my face to her face, and she said, Nick, as long as you black, don't you ever do that again. And I've been black for quite a while. <laughs> and I had to learn never to do that again. That stayed with me. I had to step back from the pain. I had to step back from the hurt and the sorrow. And I had to allow the memory of the things she had said and done for me, to me, and through me while I was growing up so that I could understand that scripture. God's faithfulness, just like your parents and grandparents and aunts and big brothers and big sisters and your elders and your deacons and your preachers, God's faithfulness is sacrificial. It's without limit. And his desire for his children's well-being is all throughout the scripture. Jesus gave it to us himself. In the book of John chapter 3, verses 16 and verses 17, Jesus declared, for God so loved the world. That word so is an adverb of degree. How much did God love us? He so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. Jesus had a twofold mission. When Jesus came to this world, he came to demonstrate the faithfulness of God, the love of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the long suffering of God. God loved us more than we loved ourselves. But Jesus didn't just come to show us the love of God. He also came to show us what we had the potential of becoming. Nobody, not Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, not John the Baptist, not Adam or Eve or Joshua or Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, or any of the prophets, no man had ever said no to the devil's perfect trifecta, where the devil used his, with precision, he used, as John said, <clears throat> the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, 
and the pride and vain glory <clears throat> of life. Jesus said one, one time, love, Jesus said, what doth it profit a man? If he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? John said, in defining the word world, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the eye, and the pride of life. Jesus was the only one who could say, I have overcome the world. I said no to the lust of the flesh. I said no to the lust of the eye. I said no to the pride of life. Don't you realize that God loved us because God is faithful? In the book of Romans chapter 5 and verses 8, Paul said, talking to our brethren at Rome, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't earn salvation. We didn't merit salvation. We weren't worthy of salvation. Mankind didn't carcass and decide to change itself and alter its behavior so that we could have reconciliation with God. No, while we were still sinners, yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. In the book of 1 John chapter 3 and verses 1, the faithfulness of God is again demonstrated by John's words, he says, Behold, look at it, be amazed. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons or the children of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. He's saying the world's not going to know you or be close to you or appreciate you or love you or want to emulate you because Jesus is better than we are. And the world was not close to him either. But Jesus didn't walk away from us. Even though we broke his heart, even though Judas betrayed him, Peter denied him, Thomas and others doubted and forsook him, still from the lofty heights of the cross. The faithfulness of God comes across when Jesus cries, Father, 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 forgive them, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They are unaware of the egregious and terrible sin that they are committing. Peter understood the ignorance of man. He stood up on that day, on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in the book of Acts chapter 2. Peter looked upon that bunch of murderers and liars and cutthroats and conspirators who had gotten together and taken the life of the faithful Jesus who had only done well, who had only preached the truth, and the common people heard him gladly. Peter said, you men of Israel, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, you, as they looked at Peter, you have with wicked hands crucified and slain. Peter on that day said, God loved you so much. And Jesus told Pontius Pilate, Pilate said, why won't you talk to me, boy? Talk to me. Don't you see? I've got the power to save your life. I've got the power to keep you off the cross. Jesus didn't say much. Many times the scripture said, and he opened not his mouth. But that was one time Jesus opened his mouth to set the record straight. He said, no, you don't take my life. You don't take my life. I give my life. I give my life. No, Pilate, 
You don't take my life. The high priest don't take my life. He had to tell Peter when Peter drew a sword and slinging it wildly. Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't a swordsman. He's trying to cut the man's head off and cut his ear off. Jesus took the ear, put the ear back on, said, put that thing away, boy. They're going to kill you. And Jesus said, don't you know I could call legions of angels. Don't you know if I wanted to win this fight in a carnal battle, it wouldn't even be a contest. In essence, what the Lord needed from Peter is what he needs from each of you. Because you understand the fidelity of God, the faithfulness of God, that God will be there for you. God needs you to be there for Jesus. All the Lord needed Peter to do was not grab his dagger, but to drop his hands. Drop his hands with courage, with faithfulness, with assurance. Look those men in the eye and say, I'm with Jesus and I will not move. The Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 12, P. Paul said to the brethren, he said, finally, brethren, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are you saying, Paul? Paul said, the devil trying to figure you out. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of losing? Where is the end of your walking with the Lord? Jesus, fidelity and faithfulness, took him to the cross, took him to his last breath, and Jesus didn't give up on us, and we sure can't give up on him. My grandfather used to have a boxer. When I was a little boy, he had a huge dog. He called him a boxer bulldog or something like that. When that thing stood up, he was over six feet tall. And he had a huge, he had made the dog a luxurious dog house with carpet on the floor and a nice roof. And he put a heater out there in the wintertime for that big old dog. He loved that old dog. But that dog was big. He was huge. He was foreboding. He was scary. And we were little children. So he had him on a chain, and whenever we knew exactly where that chain stopped, we were really stupid, and we knew exactly where that chain, we would get right to where that chain stopped, and we would mess with the dog. The dog would come and bark at us, but he could only go as far as the chain allowed him to go. How many of us are like that with the Lord? The Lord said, if you love me, if you obey me, if you trust my fidelity, the Lord said, pull up your cross. That word cross there from the Greek means a stake. What's the stake that's holding you back from serving the Lord and following him with all of your fidelity? When the apostle Paul was talking to the brethren at Rome, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and verses 2, Paul said, I beseech you. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, 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 present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which Paul said is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, Paul said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God is faithful, and according to Paul, give God all that you have. When Jesus was on that cross, he died like no man had ever died before. I remember as I stood with my grandmother and my grandfather and many others in my family and in my church over the last 50 years when they have breathed their last breath, I can tell you the moment when George's hand let go of my hand and she breathed her last breath. We die. The God said the body returns to the dust from which it came and the spirit returns to God who gave it. All I own is my record. All I own 
is my, those things that I have said and done during the course of my life. So when we die, our spirit leaves and our head drops because we have no more control over this thing that God has made that has housed our spirit. But Jesus died like no man has ever died before. Nobody has ever died like Jesus died. Jesus told John, take care of my mama. And John, you, mama, John's going to take care of you. Jesus took care of a fellow sufferer. This night you will be with me in paradise. Jesus cried to his father, why have you forsaken me? Fulfilling what the prophets had said. Jesus looked and said, I thirst and talked about the frailties of this physical body as it was dying, refusing to take the narcotic that would have helped the devil to disqualify him as our perpetuation because Jesus had to bear it all, bear it all with no ease from that pain. But after Jesus said, it is finished, it's finished, Father. What you promise in the book of Genesis chapter 3 when God gave the first messianic prophecy, the faithfulness of God that created spiritual nomenclature, that created the priesthood, that created the clear and evident bloodline that led all the way to Joseph, Mary, and that young baby laying in a feeding trough in a manger wrapped in a swaddling cloth. Jesus said, it is finished. And then Jesus makes a statement, Father, into thy hands I, I commit my spirit. Then the Bible says, and John records, because he was the only one that was there, that he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Jesus died at the moment that he decided to die. Jesus held on and suffered so that he could be our example. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 21, For hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Notice what Peter said, Who did no sin, neither was gal found in his mouth. In the book of 1 John chapter 2 and verses 6, John says to every one of us who love the faithfulness and fidelity and trust of our God and Father, he that saith he abided in him ought also himself walk even as he walked. So I want you to keep this in mind this evening. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 13, the Apostle Paul was talking to the church at Corinth that many times acted like they had lost their mind at Corinth. He wrote to them the first time when they were doing ridiculous stuff in the church. He wrote to them the second time because they were still doing ridiculous things in the church. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 13, Paul said, There had no temptation taken you, but such is common unto man. And he said, but God is faithful. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. James said one time something that reminds me of my dad and I when we were fishing. We went out to this fishing place one time, and this, this pond way back in the woods, and as fast as we threw the hooks in, the fish were coming out. Boy, we were catching them, and my string was getting heavy, and we were going to have a great fish fry when we got home. I said, Daddy, boy, these fish are really hungry tonight. My daddy said, Nick, let me stop you right there. He said, these fish are not hungry. I said, but Danny, we're catching them as fast as we throw the worm in there. He said, these fish are not hungry. He said, look at the water. And I looked at the water. He said, you see all that food in the water? 
There were tadpoles. There were little bugs walking on the water. There was all kinds of food in that water. My daddy said, Nick, those fish are not hungry. Those fish are greedy. And because they're greedy, they grab at that little piece of worm and we take them home and fry them up. James says that about us. And we've got to understand the faithfulness of God because he teaches us and he leads us and he helps us trying to keep us away from sin. As a matter of fact, James said, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. James says, no, no, no man is tempted of God. He said, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. James said, every man, every man is tempted. When, James? When he is drawn away by his own lust and is enticed. As a matter of fact, Titus, as Paul left Timothy at Ephesus, he left Titus at Crete. And in the book of Titus, chapter 2, 11 and 12, the faithfulness of God comes through because God teaches us. He teaches us. He teaches us so that we can make better decisions and have a better life. Paul said, for the grace of God that bring it salvation has appeared unto all men. Doing what, Paul? Teaching us. What, Paul? Teaching us. What, Paul? Teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. In essence, soberly, that's your responsibility to yourself. Be sober. Don't get drunk with pride. Don't get drunk with materialism. Don't get drunk with worldliness. Don't get drunk with the affairs and desires of the flesh. You are taught by who? By Jesus, who did no sin. Scriptures say about Jesus, as the Hebrew writer wrote, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but wasn't always tempted just as we are yet without sin. Jesus understands. Jesus understands frustration. He understands disappointment. He understands betrayal. Jesus understands because he lived it in the flesh. So Paul said soberly. Then he said righteously. That's my responsibility to my brothers and my sisters. When Jesus comes back, He's not going to ask you for an audit of your bank accounts. He's not going to tell you to bring your resume and your college diplomas. He's not going to tell you to bring letters of recommendation from big shots and politicians and millionaires in the world. No, he's not going to ask for any of that. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, many shall come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have we not done, Lord, did you see me, Lord, didn't you hear me? He's going to say, get out of my face. Get out of my face. Depart from me. For you are a worker of iniquity. Get out of my face. I, gave, I made it simple for you. Lord, I, I was hungry. You didn't feed me. But, 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 Lord, I was thirsty. You didn't give me. But Lord, Lord. I was naked, you didn't clothe me, but Lord, I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit or take care of me, but Lord, when, when did I see you like that? Lord, going to say, didn't you get the memo? You didn't get the memo? When you, see, I own everything. The cattle on the thousand hills are mine. Everything is mine. I don't need nothing from you. You can't tell me nothing I don't already know. My mama used to tell me, Nick, Boy, that's enough you don't know to make a whole new world. And don't you know that that's what God is saying to each and every one of us. The Lord's saying, I don't need anything for you. Here's the deal. When you do it unto others, I accounted it as you did it unto me. And he said, if you're going to get in my heaven, 
You better live right down here. You better understand my faithfulness to you demands that you be faithful to others. Soberly, righteously, godly. I've got to love the Lord my God with all my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength. It's called loving God with the whole man. Let me tell you something about yourself. I know you know this, and you've probably heard it before. Every one of us are two men, two persons, two individuals living inside of you. You are the spiritual man. You are the fleshly man. The one you feed will live. The one you starve will die. If you feed the fleshly man, everything, every itch is scratched. Every desire is fulfilled. Every lust is carried out. You are going to destroy your spiritual man. But if you follow the Lord, if you add to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, love, if you study, be diligent to show yourself approved, your spiritual man gets stronger and stronger and stronger, and you eventually become the type of individual that God wants you to be. The world's going to try to slow you down and destroy you. They're going to try to slow you down and destroy you. A crow will get on the back of an eagle and just sit on his back to where the eagle can't reach him with his huge talons. And he can't turn his huge beak around. And that crow will position himself to where he can aggravate that eagle and peck on his neck. True, true. The biologist will tell you this. That eagle can't fight that crow. So what he does is he begins to soar. And he goes higher and higher and higher and higher and higher until that eagle with his huge wings and the way God designed him and made him with his eyesight and his lungs and his physical build, he can fly high, but that crow at a certain point loses consciousness and falls toward the earth. When the devil comes after you, and I'll quote this again on Saturday, Peter said, be sober, 1 Peter 5 and 8, be sober, be vigilant, keep your eyes open, don't get blindsided and ambushed. For your adversary, your opponent, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. What you've got to do is stand with the Lord, don't quit, don't give up. When you began to murmur like I did on that day. I had to ask the Lord to help me and change me. Dear Lord, change not my life or my trials and sorrows to be. Renew my faith and make me strong. Change not thy will. Change me. Through teardrops fall that fall when troubles come, like storms on a rolling sea, let thy beacon, Father, guide my ship to port. Change not the storm, Father, change me. When thy holy word I don't understand, when the affairs of life and troubles I just can't see, teach my eyes, give me sight and wisdom. Change not thy word, Father, change me. If the fruit thou hast given me to eat tastes bitter and sour, I plea, let not my will but thine be done. Change not the fruit, Father, change me. If sometimes I murmur and I grumble, dear Lord, sometimes it gets hard because of the cross I carry for thee. Keep it firm on my shoulders, Father, but I need you to hold my hand. And change not my cross. Father, change me. If you change thy ways to please me, dear Lord, I would soon grow cold and turn from thee. 
that you may hear my prayers, dear Lord. Change not thy ways, Lord. Father, change me. There's a valley that I must cross. Someday thy face I see. Lest I forget what power is thine, Father. Change not your will. Change me. A young man was climbing a mountain. And as he climbed that mountain, he was famous. He had been on HBO and several other programs. He was climbing. He lost his footing. And in falling, he's screaming and frailing his hands, Father, save me, save me, Father, save me, save me, Father, please save me, please save me. He caught a limb, and he's hanging for dear life on that limb, hanging for dear life on that limb. And he eventually gets his second hand up, and he's hanging for dear life on that limb. And he prays, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays. Father, save me. Please save me, Father. Please, please save me, Father. Please save me. Please save me. After hours, you know, the physical man gives out. He said, I guess you're not going to save me, Father. So he closed his eyes. He couldn't hold on any longer. He bowed his head, and he let go, prepared to die. And he dropped six inches. <laughs> because God had already saved him. He didn't open his eyes to see what God had done for him already. How many of us are just as blind to the goodness the mercy, the fidelity of God. God has already saved us. He's given us everything we need. He's loved us. Let's love him back.